I wanted to know what, what kind of um, a part, you know, how big a part does music play in your life? Um, well, it used to play a really big part when I was younger, which I think is the case for most people. Um, it was a huge part when I was in my teens and my 20s. I used to go gigs all the time. Um, used to go clubbing, of course, when I was a younger, fitter person. So music was central to my life then. Uh, we were obsessed with music. You know, people would swap albums, recommend albums. Um, it, it, was a, it was a key part of social life and personal interaction. Now it's much more of an individuated thing. So mostly I listen to music if I'm walking a long distance or if I go to the gym um, or if I'm just at home and I put on a record or listen to something as I'm having a drink of beer. So I guess as with most people, it's gone from being a very social phenomenon where music is the thing that brings you together with people and you do crazy things while listening to it to being much more of an individual thing. It's something you listen to in order to relax. And I'm sure that's most people's experience, but yeah, music is, music is wonderful. And I, I like music. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, um, it's very true what you say that music tends to be a bigger part of your life in terms of especially the social aspect um when you're younger and also i it's been a while i think maybe it's due to the lockdown and all of that stuff but um since music had that real kind of emotional mm. connection where you could i don't know about you but i could spend sort of four hours or five hours or something just like listening to music straight in a row i mean drinking helps with that with yeah that, uh, <laughs> as well but um and Obviously, as somebody who makes great podcasts, um, which I find myself listening to podcasts almost as much as music these days, there are so many good ones out there from obviously the Spiked Online and Brendan O'Neill show and uh, the Joe Rogan stuff I really like. Um, there's, there's all sorts of podcasts. I mean, completely away from those type of podcasts as well. It, it, podcasts have never been bigger. So how often do you, as somebody who makes podcasts, listen to podcasts? Um yeah, I'm not a big podcast person. I know that's really bad. And um, I don't even listen to my own one. I don't listen to my own one because I can't stand the sound of my own voice. Uh, <laughs> so everyone should listen to my podcast because the guests are always really, really good. Um, I listen to the Spiked podcast every week. That's the podcast that's done by the younger members of the Spiked team, which I genuinely think is is the best weekly guide you can get for a critical overview of what's going on uh, in the world. Um, I listen to some Joe Rogan stuff. That, that for, for me, it depends on the guest. If it's a guest who I really want to listen to, then I, I tune into Joe Rogan. Um, I listen to the Rubin Report via podcast often rather than watching it on YouTube. So I, I listen to Dave Rubin. I've been on Dave Rubin's show a couple of times. I think he's a good generous interviewer he has really interesting guests and he, him and rogan they're, they're part of this new phenomenon where it's almost like the creation of a new media uh, you know for people yeah. and i think this is what's so important about podcasts you know even though i don't get to listen to them as often as i would like to um i think the most important thing about them which is presumably one of the reasons you're doing yours as well is that i think there are lots of people out there looking for different kinds of media outlets that might better reflect their concerns or their points of view or or what they think politically or socially or culturally because I do think a lot of people have the experience at the moment of thinking that the mainstream media is too narrow it's not reflective of broader opinion or it's not reflective of certain controversial opinions or difficult opinions or however we might want to describe it and uh, I think the great thing about the rise of the podcast over the post few, past few years is it's created this whole new world in which people can really create their own media and tune in, pick and choose, tune in to who they want to tune into um, and hear information they might not otherwise hear in the more mainstream media. I guess one of the dangers with that is that you end up finding yourself in a bit of an echo chamber. So I always encourage people, right. you know, listen to stuff you disagree with as well which is one of the good things about Rogan I mean Rogan does not give his guests an easy ride even if they are guests he largely agrees with on fundamental issues he will always press them he'll push them he'll give them a bit of a hard time sometimes I think that's really important that um, I think one of the great dangers of the contemporary period is that people 
wrap themselves in the comfort blanket of opinions they already agree with. And th there's always a danger of dogma when you do that. You, there's always a danger you will become accidentally dogmatic and um, repetitive. So it's, it's very important to expose oneself, so to speak, to different opinions, things you might hate or things that will help you to change your mind. But there is so much variance in the podcast world. I think that it, it gives people plenty scope to do precisely that. Yeah, I think you've just got to be careful with the podcasts that you choose. But someone like Rogan, it's quite weird to see him being described as this. I, I, I read articles where he's being described as this sort of, you know, far right character. He seems completely balanced, probably like central. I mean, he doesn't help his cause with kind of the inclusion of people like Alex Jones, who's like a complete nutcase, as far as I'm concerned. I've watched all four hours and 40 minutes of that crazy interview. I mean, it made for great entertainment, to be mm. fair to him. Um, but to see him being described as sort of this right wing commentator is bizarre and it's not reflective of his political opinions. And he's not really somebody who rams his opinions down anyone's throat when, when he's giving an interview, uh, when he's um, allowing uh, people to speak on his podcast rather, and when he's doing the interviews with them, he, he really gives them an opportunity to say what they think. And you never hear, or very rarely do you hear raised voices or kind of mm. people behaving in a really uncivilized way. You, you hear rational thought through arguments and, and, and you know, they tend to last for two hours as well. So they, they really get to the kind of heart of the matter, which is great to see and is kind of in contrast to a lot of the news sources. So one thing I was wondering, because you, know, you do your show every week and you're very kind of clued up in terms of current affairs, where do you actually get your news from? Do you kind of absorb all the news from the different outlets, some of whom you think the reporting isn't balanced and then just kind of try to see what you make of it. Yeah, I think um, I do a bit of pick and choosing. Uh, I, I, I look at the BBC website, I don't know, six or seven times a day just to make sure I'm not missing a story. See, one problem I have is I don't use social media at all, really. Uh, the only social media I use is Instagram. And the reason I use Instagram is be precisely because it isn't full of news and opinion and people arguing with each other. I just, it's a nice place just to sink off to for a half an hour, just to look at nice photographs. Um, I don't use Twitter. I don't use Facebook. Uh, I used to use Facebook, but I don't anymore uh, because I find social media unpleasant. And um, I think it's becoming a, a, an unpleasant place. I think it's becoming a, a, often a quite hateful place. Uh, and it's become a kind of self-reinforcing, people create their own self-reinforcing bubbles. Now, the downside to not using social media is that it, it can be difficult to access news quickly and it can be difficult to keep your finger on the pulse because I guess one upside of social media, particularly Twitter, is that the news comes out very fast. You can watch things in real time as they happen or as they change or as reports come out. So I miss out on that. So I do have to make a bit of an effort to go looking for things. And I do that by, um, I read the BBC website, as I say, six or seven times a day. Um, I read the New York Times and the Guardian, both of which I tend to disagree with, but I think it's important to see what that section of society is thinking. Um, I don't know what we'd call them, the liberal elite, the chattering classes, um, however we want to describe them. I think it's important to know where they're at, what they're thinking, what they're saying. Are they making any sense? Are they saying anything interesting or are they saying the same old stuff? And I think keeping on top of that is really important. Um, and then in terms of other news, I read, I look at the Telegraph. I think the Telegraph's news coverage is pretty good. Um, I read The Spectator, of course, which I also write for. And then in the US, as I say, I look at the New York Times. I also look at Reason magazine. Reason is a libertarian magazine based in Washington, DC. It's very, very good on campus controversies, free speech controversies, um, woke culture, and all those kinds of questions. It, it does good coverage of those. Um, so that's kind of where I try to, and I'm sure there are others I'm forgetting, but that's where I try and find out what's going on in the world and what are different sections of society saying about it and i think if if you're interested in the news the best thing you can do is firstly find out the facts of what's happening and secondly just look at an assortment of opinion in terms of how people are interpreting those events and if you do that it's a pretty useful way to to then work out what you think as an individual and where you stand in relation to these things 
Yeah, I think that's bang on. I think if you read a variety of, of publications, don't create your own echo chamber, as you were saying earlier. Um, that's pretty helpful. It's not. It's not going to be great if you just read, you know, the Guardian and not the Telegraph, because mm. you know you don't get a cross section. I mean, particularly because you're professionally talking about these these issues. So I would have I would have expected that, and you know that's that's not surprising. Um, but in terms of music, um, your first choice of we've got five songs here that. Um, that mean a lot to you. And the first is Astral Weeks, Van Morrison. I mean, oh, presumably you, you love the whole album. Oh, I'm obsessed with this album. Um, completely and utterly obsessed. I th it is unquestionably the album I've listened to most. And I was thinking actually quite recently, because I was talking about the album with someone and I was thinking how many times have I listened to it? And uh, it, it just must be thousands and thousands of times. Um, I discovered it when I was 16 years old. I was doing my GCSEs and um, I knew a few Van Morrison songs, the more popular ones, and I'd never listened to Astral Week, so I discovered it on a cassette and uh, just became obsessed with it. And I listened to it all the time, all the time from beginning to end. It's one of those albums where there's a story. I don't know what the story is. I don't even know if it makes much sense because it's very hippie-ish and um, astral and strange, but there's definitely a story. So it's one of those albums where you don't find yourself fast forwarding or skipping songs. It's just, it has to be listened to. All eight songs have yeah. got to be listened to in my view from beginning to end. But the first song, first song, Astral Weeks, I just think is uh, wonderful. It's It's one of those rare songs where you can genuinely lose yourself in it. And I don't think I've ever had the experience of listening to that song in particular and thought to myself, oh, I'm bored, I've listened to this 50,000 times. I've never once had that thought in relation to that song. And I've had that thought probably in relation to all other songs I like, where you find yourself playing yeah. it rather too often and you think, oh, I should give this a break. I've never had that feeling in relation to Astral Weeks, the song. So it, it, for me, even though it was made in 1968, which is a very long time ago, I think that's the high point of popular music, which I, it might be a bit of a depressing thing to say. Um, and I might be completely wrong. I'm sure most people think I am. But I do think that's the high point in terms of that, that combination of folk, jazz, mysticism, um, dreaminess. I think it has everything and it's it, it, every time I listen to it I find I think about something new while I'm listening. Yeah, he's he's an incredibly soulful artist Van Morrison and I kind of agree with you I mean probably the my favorite era is the 70s um, but one thing the last time I spoke I had something that I wanted to say uh, in relation to your social uh, comments on social media and you talking about 1968 being a high point just reminded me of it which is that I find that people who spend so much time on social media and increasingly I find myself personally wondering, should I be spending more time on social media? Um, is it going to make business better if I spend more time on social media? Am I obliged to do it? And grappling with that, the sort of, you feel like it's almost like a responsibility and an obligation to spend more time on social media. Um, and then, you know, grappling with the other side of it, which is, I want to spend more time listening to LPs like Astral Weeks. I want to have three or four hour um, dinners and, and lunches uh, and, and spend them with my friends and not even like reach for my phone once. I don't want to write loads of stuff on some platform and have it all analyzed and sent off to big tech to sort of then sell me crap. <laughs> I, I, I want to, in a way, I just want to delete it all, throw yeah. my computer down a well and just, you know, listen to vinyl and read books. Well, that's a that's a very astral week's outlook, I think, um, if we could mix up our time periods. I mean, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think social media has great uses. I think one of the things that it's probably good at is keeping people connected. I'm sure there are huge numbers of people who use, particularly Facebook, who use it for the perfectly legitimate reason of connecting with family members who are dispersed around the world or keeping in touch with old friends. And And for that, I'm sure it's very good. But the way in which social media has morphed into this kind of obsessive thing where people spend a ridiculous amount of time on there, they seek constant validation for their opinions or 
uh, their image or their ideas or whatever else it might be. I think it can become quite a, 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 a relationship of dependency, um, which I think is unhealthy and, and, a, and also a relationship of immediacy. And the thing that the reason I've never used Twitter is because the thought of me being able to express an idea without first giving it a lot of consideration and maybe discussing it with friends and maybe going for a walk to mull it over. I find that a terrifying idea. The fact that something in my head could become published in the world in a matter of seconds, just by me using my thumbs on my phone. That's not something I trust myself with. And um, I think a lot more thoughtfulness is required in the contemporary world. Um, slowness, um, sometimes solitude. Uh, you know, the, the point I would make to if, if I had any influence on, on younger people is, you know, when you feel that urge to go on Twitter and attack someone or say something or join a, a Twitter storm or just express an opinion you're not certain about, you know, don't do it. Go for a long walk, listening to an album or sit down and read three or four chapters of a novel. I, I think people are missing out on those more reflective parts of life in favor of this instantaneous expression, this instantaneous publication, which I think can sometimes be quite unhealthy. Yeah, and we're all uh, we're all kind of getting addicted to the is, is it dopamine? Mm. Uh, I think I, I heard James Lindsay on the Rogan podcast saying that we're all marinating in dopamine, which uh, <laughs> made me paranoid all week about <laughs> marinating in dopamine. Uh, but I mean, it, it's it's. I feel like with social media and social media culture, I mean, what do you make of, of things like on, on YouTube? Because I don't know what to make of it, where you see, you know, you could easily see Van Morrison, Brown Eyed Girl, reaction video, someone listening to Brown Eyed Girl for the first time. And honestly, you know, I've seen this, this, this phenomenon being written about as if it's extremely cultural, culturally relevant and, mm. and, 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 you know, perhaps it is, this is kind of tapping into the pulse of culture now. Reaction videos are part of young culture, but isn't there a young person out there who has made an Astral Weeks uh, and it's kind of got like four plays a song on the SoundCloud and no one gives a stuff about it because we're all just tuning into kind of stuff that requires less effort than listening to Astral Weeks. Yeah, I think that's right. And, um, well, on Astral Weeks itself, it actually took a very long time for Astral Weeks to become an established album. Uh, you talk about your favorite period being the 70s. It was in the 70s that Astral Weeks became yeah. uh, a, a reputable record. You know, in the, in the late 60s and 68, everyone missed. hated it. Van Morrison hated it. He thought it was overproduced. Um, most reviews were pretty lukewarm. Most reviews said, why didn't he stick with the pop music of Brown Eyed Girl, which was released in 1967? and which is a wonderful song why did he have to go off and make this weird mystical folk album so it was pretty negative it wasn't really until the 70s that people and then you know someone like bruce springsteen in the early 70s i think said astral weeks is not an album it's a religion and i think at, 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 in that moment it started to become more of a phenomenon it started to sell more it started to become come to be taken more seriously and now it's often in the you know top 10 albums of all time and but things take time um you know they do they think they take time to make um although astral weeks was made in two days um but i'm sure it was stewing in van morrison's head for much longer than that um it, it, you know things take time to make they take time to have an impact they you know people need to engage with them people need to think about them and i think you're right in this current moment when everything all the emphasis is on instantaneousness or reaction how do you feel instantly in this moment about this thing you're looking at i think it it creates a kind of a, a worryingly shallow outlook where you're constantly flitting from one thing to the next um which i don't think is necessarily conducive to the kind of um sense of reflection and slowness that people often need if they're going to create something cultural or something important. So I thought that I think reaction videos are fascinating and bizarre. And I've often wondered how long will it be until we see um, reaction to reaction videos. Yeah, and, I but, then I, uh, but then I saw one and I couldn't believe it. I, I, the other day, um, my niece sent me uh, a video of Billie Eilish 
res reacting to Billie Eilish fans who were reacting to a Billie Eilish video. And I just thought, this is, this is screwing up my head. I don't understand what I'm looking at. And then, you, and then I started thinking, will there be a, a reaction video of Billie Eilish fans responding to Billie Eilish responding oh, to fans? I mean, it's just, it's, it's this nonstop circle of um, instantaneous reaction to, world, to the world, to music. And what we lose as a consequence of that, I think, is, the, is that sphere in which you need the space to experiment and think and do something different. Um, you know, imagine if there is a young Van Morrison style person around. Van Morrison was 23 when he made Astral Weeks, which is ridiculous. Wow. If there is someone around like that now, I mean, the pressure on them would be don't do Astral Weeks. You know, the record companies, the internet, uh, that instantaneous culture, they don't want an album which is made up of eight songs, most of which are seven or eight minutes long, and some of which are quite difficult to listen to for the first time. Yeah. It takes time. I don't think the culture is conducive to that. So that's the thing that worries me about the tech era. I think technology is great, connecting with people is great, but I worry about what we're losing as a consequence. Yeah, I, it's depressing to think, but I, I don't know where culture's going when, when we have valuable space being taken up with this crap. And it's going to show up in everybody's feeds. You know, anybody who listens to Van Morrison or, or any of the, the great older artists, um, they will get these reaction videos in, in their feed. And, uh, you know, it's not a big deal, but it's just more reflective of where we're at. Mm. And, uh, and, you know, the mere fact that I'm commenting about these reaction videos rather than telling you about <laughs> some new album that I listened to that reminded me of Van, Mor uh, that reminded me of Van Morrison is extremely, um, <laughs> you know, depressing as well, because it kind of shows that I'm a bit of a hypocrite in moaning about all this. But um, before we move on to your next choice, I wanted to, to see what you made of, because um, I've been following with a degree of fascination um, and firsthand, because I went to one of his gigs at the London Palladium. Um, Van Morrison's uh, whole lockdown uh, <laughs> lockdown protest songs. Um, I think he's kind of been taken a bit out of, um, he's been misinterpreted somewhat because there's been a lot of people saying that he's a conspiracy theorist, that he's telling people not to wear masks. Uh, I've had musicians on this podcast and I've mentioned to them, oh, you know, I went to see Van Morrison the other week at the Palladium. It was amazing. You know, it's giving me a bit of hope that live music can return. Because, uh, you know, God knows a lot of people are pretty depressed about the current situation. No one knows when it's going to come back. The industry is over um, for the foreseeable future. And so to see someone like Van Morrison saying, you know what, I'm going out, I'm going to do gigs. I'm going to let my crew work again. I'm going to let my band work again. Um, I'm a working musician. I found that quite uplifting. He didn't tell anyone to take off their masks. He didn't say, you know fuck the police or something during the gig. <laughs> you know, he was like pretty, uh, he was, he just focused on the music. Um, so I was wondering what you thought of, 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 of all that stuff, um, of the anti-lockdown songs and, and what he was saying about um, the lockdown. Well, firstly, I'm incredibly jealous that you got to see him at the Palladium. A couple of my friends saw him there too. Um, and they said it was uh, wonderful. I, I completely agree. I think it's amazing that he is, um, breaking the deadlock around music uh, that we've seen over the past six months and going on the road and, and playing a live gig and getting, as you say, his, his crew and his musicians back doing some work. I think that is really uplifting and it's, it, he's a role model as far as I'm concerned. I thought his anti-lockdown songs were really interesting. Um, they were not conspiratorial. They were about um, freedom, essentially, the freedom of people to make choices in their lives and to, um, make culture and make music and, and, and not to constantly have to follow rules. Um, the thing that really struck me is that it fell to someone who is now quite old uh, in the music business to, to say something rebellious about yeah. that lockdown culture. I mean, that's a real indictment, I think, sadly, of um, younger musicians. You know, why have they not done something or said something similar? Uh, you know, traditionally, pop music, rock music, however we want to describe it, was often at the cutting edge of 
risque opinion or anti-authoritarian opinion or you know kicking back against the pricks and arguing for more choice and more freedom you know pop music and rock music embodied that to a large extent i think over recent years it's become worryingly conformist and um you know not only van morrison finds himself in hot water but someone like morrissey um who i don't agree with on all issues but i think um the fact that he's pro-Brexit, the fact that he is concerned about mass immigration, that's the issue on which I have most difficulty with what he says. But the fact that he says these things and he gets so much flack, and we even had a record shop uh, in Wales, I think, refusing to stock his albums. Um, and lots of people online saying, um, my love affair with the Smiths is over, I can't cope with this anymore. And then um, Nick Cave, who I love, issued, uh, uh, he didn't issue a statement, but he, in response to a question that he was asked, he said, listen, you all need to grow up, right? Morrissey made some great songs and his current opinions have no impact on that whatsoever. And you've got to stop expecting your cultural heroes to give you the political uh, ideas that you feel you need. So Nick Cave was one of the few voices of reason, as he very often is. Right. Um, but yeah, from from Morrissey to Van Morrison, uh, there is there's this weird thing at the moment where if pop stars, rock stars, if they say something that cuts against the grain of mainstream society, they really get it in the neck. Um, and my question is, where are the new punks where are the new rebels where are the younger groups who are saying you know screw lockdown let's have a gig somewhere in public or something like that where which you might have if there had been a lockdown in 1976 we would probably have seen something like that That's if true. there had been a lockdown in 1967 or 1968 we might have seen something like that i mean actually woodstock which is arguably the most famous concert ever took place during a pandemic. It took place during the um, Asian flu pandemic in the late 1960s when huge numbers of people in America were infected and many were dying. But Woodstock went ahead, it didn't stop it. So that spirit is sadly lacking sometimes and I think that's quite concerning. Yeah, it's unbelievably strange that you haven't had one person other than a guy who's in his 70s. <laughs> and the only person who's joined him is Eric Clapton. Eric Clapton said, you know, I'm going to stand up and be counted here. I really respect what Van's doing, and many of us do. But, you know, I'm not sure who the us is, because no one else has kind of mm. put their head above the parapet and said, I really respect what Van's doing. But I, I, I really respect what he's doing. He's not, he's not come out with any conspiracy theory. He's just no. said that the lockdown is having a damaging effect, and it is. And I think people will join in with what he's saying, potentially, but maybe it will take months. Yeah will take all their finances to be destroyed and for them to suddenly yeah. realize that the gigs aren't coming back next year. Yeah. It's, if we are where we are now, you know, look at Brexit, look at anything um, that, that the political systems at the moment um, have to deal with. There's all this back and forth and there, there always will be. Um, when we've entrenched ourselves so firmly into this lockdown culture now that God knows what will happen. So. Yeah. Where on earth is, is the kind of anti-lockdown album? If it takes Van Morrison, then something is, is <laughs> really, really wrong. Um, but he, he's an amazing artist and it was you know, great to see him doing that. So your next choice I hadn't heard before, but I really enjoyed it. Had, it did have a, quite a wistful uh, quality to it uh, by the Furies when you were Sweet 16. Yeah. Um, when did you start listening to that song? Uh, when I was a child. Um, I picked that because um, I come from an Irish background. My parents are Irish immigrants. Um, so my whole childhood was involved listening to Irish music in the car, in the house, um, in public, in the pub, where, you know, people used to take their kids to the pub in those days. Um, so I grew up on Irish music, bands like the Furies. The Furies are a very well-known Irish band um, formed in the 70s and really have had hits from the 70s through to the 90s. Um, when You Were Sweet 16 is their most famous song. It's not an original Fury song, it's a cover. Um, but in Ireland, that will be one of the best known songs. I mean, every time that opening banjo comes on in a pub, you can be guaranteed people will start getting emotional and standing up and singing along. So. It's a very well-known song in Ireland, and every time I hear it, it just drags me back to my childhood. Every single time, it, you know, some songs have that kind of visceral 
reaction because they're such a key intimate part of uh, uh, some part of your life that every time you hear them they just kind of drag you back to those memories and and that song by the furies is one of those songs that does that so i listen to it regularly as a kind of nostalgia trip it's a great song and it's it's an incredibly beautiful version of the song but i listen to it as a nostalgia trip because it just makes me think about childhood and and that period yeah it's got a great set the it's got some mandolin on it, I think, and yeah. uh, the guitars, and it's got it's yeah, it's got a very kind of rich folky yeah. sound to it, which is which is really great. I was kind of amazed that I hadn't, I hadn't heard of the Furies before, but it seems like they're very much you know that they're an Irish, yeah. I mean a lot of, I mean a lot to people in Ireland from from what you say. And I've only sadly been to Dublin once, which was amazing, but. I would love to go back. I mean, maybe I'll go to Belfast, uh, go to Northern Ireland to see Van. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but yeah, the, so the so the Fury song, yeah, I, I loved that, and that that was a new piece of music um, which I really enjoy. As was the the song by Alison Moye, uh, who I or Moye, I'm not sure how you pronounce it. Moye. Is it Moye? Yeah. Um, I I uh, I love her music, um, but I haven't listened to much of it. Uh, but that song was one of those songs where, you know, the minute it comes on, you think, God, this is a great, yeah. great pop song. And this is so 80s. I love that snare sound, the gated snare. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. And so how come you chose that? Uh, I, I love Alison Moye. I just think she's amazing and wonderful. And there's a period in the 1980s, I think probably 85 to 88, and which is way before your time but if you were if you were around between 85 and 88 um you will love Alice and Moye I mean that's all there is to it there was a period in which she was she, before she was a solo singer she was in a duet called Yazoo um oh, yeah. which, which had an incredibly famous song Only You um she I didn't know that she was part yeah of that. so she, great yeah so that's uh, i mean that's like a national anthem essentially that's yeah. one of the great british pop songs that's from the early 80s and then in the mid to late 80s she made some really good really good solo stuff and she's carried on making some really good music um so i picked that because uh, i love 80s pop music and I'm, I'm obsessed with 80s pop music and 80s music more broadly um and uh, i think that's a really good example of it just those kinds of songs which at the time might not this is one of the most curious things about the 80s i was thinking about this recently at the time you could have songs which would get i, I don't know where that song in particular is this love i don't i can't remember where it got to in the charts i'm pretty sure it didn't get to number one but you can have this situation in the 80s where there are songs which get to, you know, number 15 or 16 or 17 in the charts. And at the time, you're listening, thinking, oh, that's all right. It's not too bad, but it hasn't done very well in, in, on top of the pops. But then 30 years later, they are the songs that live on. And yes. there are so many songs like that from the 80s, which at the time, I guess the 1980s was a fairly capitalistic commercialized decade so things tended to be measured by their you know the success they had um economically and, and in terms of the charts but as people who are interested in culture will be well aware it often takes a longer time for you often need posterity to step in and to decide over a period of time what's actually going to stand the test of time and i think that song is this love by alison moye is a really good example of that um, a song that it, it, you could listen to afresh now, whereas I'm sure what was number one at the same time has probably been forgotten. That's just a useful yeah. lesson to remember. Yeah, it's a ver it's very true. Um, I mean, the, the the kind of the precise statistics of things like this. Um, my my area of nerdy expertise is Elton John's music, uh, and you know, for example, Tiny Dancer was a was a number forty hit <laughs> single. And I mean, wow. you know, you get that. And there will be examples for, for all of the kind of big heritage artists. A lot of those yeah. songs that have become standards, you know, wouldn't have had, they wouldn't necessarily have been number ones. Interesting. Well, yeah, I think um, a very good example of that is the Smiths. And yeah. um, I mean, the Smiths in the 80s were very big for an indie band, of course. And they often, they sometimes got into the top 10, but usually the top 20, maybe the top 30. And if you think about a song like um, 
there is a light that never goes out. I mean, it was a popular song in the eighties, but it's now become a standard. Uh, it's, yeah. it's, it's now become this incredibly important um, and signpost in British culture to such an extent that following the Manchester atrocity in 2017, the, the front page of the Manchester Evening News was just the words, there is a light that will never go out. And uh, there aren't many songs that have that, um, play that role in culture and that role in people's lives. And um, that didn't get to number one in the 80s, it didn't get anywhere near number one. So I'm fascinated by that process, by the way in which posterity, which I guess is just people's judgment over time and people de deciding what's important and what's beautiful, um, it's, a, it's often a very slow process and it will take a long time for these things to work themselves out. I've always been fascinated by that cultural process and I think there's lots of music which has stood the test of time, which is a very good illustration of the importance of those kind of judgments of posterity. Yeah. Yeah, and I I wonder how um, how time will will judge the the current era, um, and and maybe time uh, will will help with you know everything that we've been talking about. Um, maybe indeed over time there, there must be already a growing movement against kind of instantly you know gratuitous uh, social media culture, but I guess there'll be more of a reactionary movement. Um, mm people will use time to kind of judge what, what are the technological developments that have been really good and are, and are valuable and um, help culture and what, and help our lives and what are the ones that, you know, maybe we need to steer clear of or be wary of. Um, but in, ter in terms of music, um, it is, it is usually a pretty reliable process. What becomes standards, you know, time is, is a better indicator of, of quality than, than sort of the charts of the day. Absolutely. Uh, what what was strange about the next song by the Cocteau Twins is that um, literally the day before you sent me um, your list, I just got a, a WhatsApp from a friend saying, how had I never heard of this band? <laughs> and so I listened to Heaven or Las Vegas, their oh. album, for the first time. Um, I'd, I'd never heard of the Cocteau Twins. Um, but so Ikea Guinea, is that? Yeah. Um, I loved it, but what... You know, how did you get into the Cocteau Twins? Was it this song, or, or did or did did you kind of get into House of Las Vegas and then um, and then um, you know work your way back? Heaven yeah, or Las Vegas, sorry, that's that, that's exactly what it was. Heaven or Las Vegas, which was released in um, 1990, I think. So that's yeah. one of their later albums. I think it's maybe their fifth or sixth. Um, which when we were kids we people were obsessed with it because it, it because i mean they're a kind of scottish goth band you know uh, goth style staring at your feet scruffy hair kind of music um which was <laughs> very big in the 80s um but with heaven or las vegas they just exploded into this much more pop sound while retaining their mysteriousness i mean it's uh, the famous thing um liz fraser the singer who i think is um one of the greatest British uh, cultural exports of the past 50 years. Um, the most famous thing about her singing in, in the Cocteau Twins is that you can't understand what she's saying. And um, often she's not saying anything in English at all. She uh, invents her own language sometimes um, and just kind of squeals and screams and sings in this in extraordinary way. Um, that song I picked, Ak Akia Guinea, um, I just think is the high point of the Cocteau Twins. It's so strange and odd. It makes no sense. You can't sing along to it because you don't understand what she's saying. So, which is quite frustrating because it's one of those songs you really want to sing along to. But it's just, I think it's just a perfect slice of dream pop. And um, you can really lose yourself in it. And it's just a perfect little three and a half minutes of joy. So it's it's just a very joyful song. It it might be about something depressing. I have no idea what it's about, but it's a very joyful song to listen to. But the Cocteau Twins were very culturally influential in the 80s, even though they weren't chart toppers. Um, Prince loved them. Um, Madonna was a fan. I mean, they had these they had this incredible following among really influential, successful pop stars. And I think, and they're still very influential now. They, I think they have a huge influence on uh, some contemporary bands. 
um, I've seen interviews with contemporary bands who, who mention them and mention them as an influence. So they're one of those bands, again, who have stood the test of time. And I think with them, that will grow. I think we haven't seen the end point yet of um, their potential influence on, on culture. You see flashpoints of it when people refer to them. Uh, and I th but I think that will expand further and further. And I think maybe 10, 20 years time, they really will be established as, you know, this incredible band from the UK who had a really positive impact on popular culture. Yes, it, it seems like word is spreading. I mean, they had, they had, a, huge, they had a huge amount of um, listeners on Spotify and, mm. and um, you know, they, they seem like they've got quite a, quite a cult fan base. Yeah. Um, and it'll be, yeah. I, I was amazed to to receive the the recommendation like twice in two days. And, and <laughs> That's a sign. You need I to never, dig in. Yeah, it's a sign to, to to investigate them further. And and their name came from uh, from a like a deep cut by Simple Minds apparently. Right. Um. And uh, and yeah, it's fascinating about the singing and and just their whole sound. I can yeah, I can really see Prince being influenced. And of course, yeah. you know, Madonna's. 80s records uh, you know I'm not such a fan of Madonna hop hopping on every single um, fad in pop music every couple of years with her new stuff but her 80s records are exquisitely produced yeah. um, so I can see that uh, that these guys would have would have had an influence the but 80s also the um, yeah and the influence uh, I mean the influence was was quite immediate in some way so um, Liz Fraser the singer she sang with Massive Attack in the 90s so probably Massive Attack's most famous song Teardrop um I think yeah. is it Teardrop anyway it, yeah, yeah, is it is. is by her she's the singer on that she's that mysterious voice on that song um huh. so she she's been lurking around culture in a really influential way under the radar but influential all at the same time um which I think makes her very fascinating and makes that band very fascinating. I would encourage everyone to listen to the Cocteau Twins. Yeah, yeah, I, I think it's going to be great to kind of investigate them, investigate them further. Um, your, your, final, your final song choice is I Am The Resurrection, uh, which of course is a, a classic uh, by the Stone Roses. Um, were, were the Stone Roses, would, but the Stone Roses Britpop? They were pre-Britpop. Pre, but yes, they influenced all the Britpop. Yeah, um, and uh, Liam was kind of, you know, the, the first Liam Gallagher, the arguably the superior Liam uh, version of Liam Gallagher was Ian Brown. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I am. The, so, were you a big fan of the Stone Roses, and, and did your, you know, did you like the Britpop that followed as well? Um, I love the Stone Roses. So the Stone Roses really. Came, became big in the late 80s. Um, so that album, the, the first album, the self-titled album, which oh, closes with, album. yeah, it's so good, closes with I Am The Resurrection. I think that was released in 88 or maybe early 89. So that's when they were around. And then Britpop was more kind of 93, 94, 95. So they were a huge influence on that. Um, I just love that Stone Roses album. I just find it incredibly positive. I think they were a really, you know, there was this bit of a prejudice in the 80s that indie music was very depressing and sad and and um, full of young people feeling sorry for themselves. But in fact, if you listen to some of that music, if you listen to the Cocteau Twins, it's incredibly uplifting. If you listen to the Smiths, I mean, their lyrics are hilarious. They're really, really funny. Um, even on a song like Heaven Knows I'm Miserable Now, it's so ridiculously miserable that it's actually quite comedic. So I, I think there's loads of uplifting stuff. In, and, and then I think the Stone Roses are the, are the high point of that incredibly positive music, which you can hear in their songs and in the song titles, you know, What the World is Waiting For, um, for example, which is such an upbeat song. I Am the Resurrection, which is just... Arro you know, arrogant and positive. I want to be adored. Um, all those, you know, the titles themselves really speak to that kind of hedonistic, um, positive moment. And I think some of that, I think, has been lost. Uh, Britpop, I think, was a bit of a caricature of it. Uh, I say this as someone who, I love Oasis, and I remember the Oasis versus Blur um, controversy, and I took the side of Oasis, I think, um, 
I thought I, I was never really a fan of Blur. Uh, but I think Britpop was a bit of a caricature of uh, uh, Stone Roses, although there's some great stuff in Britpop. But I just, the reason I love I Am The Resurrection, I mean, you people should always listen to the original long version, which is about, I think, seven or eight minutes long. And it's got this great yeah. guitar solo and drums that goes on for like five minutes. And it's just ridiculously over the top, but also wonderful. People should also always listen to that version rather than the three minute version. And it's just really stirring. And it's that, it's a perfect moment of, that kind of youthful arrogance of just thinking I'm young, I'm attractive, I'm fashionable, I'm going to have a good time. And, and when pop music says that, I think it can sometimes, I mean, pop music often says really important things as well, but sometimes just saying that can be quite stirring. And when we were kids, we just loved that song and danced to that song all the time. Yeah, I think it's, there's a lot of talk at the moment of pop culture being inextricably linked with politics. And, you know, whilst that's true and there've been some great political pieces of pop music, I think it's great to have the carefree aspect. You know, I remember a time not so long ago where I couldn't give a rat's ass about politics. All I cared about <laughs> was pop music and, you know, being with friends and feeling good and, and you know, trying to be generous and kind and, and, and help help friends where possible and just have a good time, be with loved ones. And, that, and, and, and also feel, you know, something like listening to that, um, you know, I Am The Resurrection or, or like even, and especially the longer versions, like the 10 minute version of Fool's Gold that comes after it mm. on the record. The whole record just makes you feel great. Um, yeah, and it's, um, there, was a, there was quite a lot of that music in the, in the late eighties. Um, there was also Happy Mondays um, yeah. And their song "Twenty Four Hour Party People" is like a more druggy version, I guess, of of the Stone Roses stuff. Um, and it's it, it was a very hedonistic moment, um, you know. And and I think it was bound up with a political moment, but it didn't talk about it. So the political moment at that time, there was huge change sweeping the world. I mean, the Soviet Union collapsed, the Berlin Wall came down, um, politics changed in a space of about a year or two, the political makeup of the entire world changed dramatically. And a lot of people felt very positive about that, especially people in Europe who saw um, the Berlin Wall coming down, the evil empire falling apart, and there was a real sense of possibility and a real sense of change. I think bands like that captured that phenomenon without ever feeling they needed to beat us over the head with it. And maybe even without being 100% aware of it. I think sometimes the pressure on bands to be political can have a bit of a deadening impact on their culture. Um, so at the moment, I think one of the problems with contemporary popular culture is this constant pressure on bands and actors and singers and everyone else to say the right political message, especially on social media. You have to black out your Instagram page for Black Lives Matter. You have to take the knee. You have to say Greta Thunberg is, is the most important person in the world. You have to um, talk about recycling. I mean, th this pressure to conform to supposed political radicalism, but actually they're fairly mainstream ideas. I find that worrying. I was so disturbed by the, some of the statistics I saw after the Brexit referendum the number of cultural figures and cultural institutions who were pro remain as if they had to be you just got a sense that if you're in the cultural sphere you had to be a remainer there was no choice and that's why it was so fascinating when Morrissey said he was pro Brexit and I I saw Morrissey perform in uh, the Hollywood Bowl in Los Angeles about two years ago and the audience was full of mostly Mexicans who love Morrissey and these hip Los Angeles kids and, and lots of black kids as well, actually. And 25,000 people crammed together in the Hollywood Bowl and Morrissey got them all chanting uh, at the end of one of his songs, he got them all chanting Brexit, Brexit, Brexit. And it was just this <laughs> bizarre, ridiculous, extraordinary moment. And I just thought to myself, why is it falling to someone who is, 60 years old to do something like this whereas lots of other bands um are kind of nodding along to that social media pressure to say the correct thing 
And I think that probably has a, a negative impact on culture. And so the reason I love that Stone Roses song and also lots of Happy Monday song is because that's one of the uh, one of the episodes in popular culture where it was like we don't give a crap and uh, about that stuff. We're not you two. We're not going to make a worthy album about politics in Northern Ireland. I love you two, by the way, but they did a lot of that. And instead, we're just going to make carefree, hedonistic music. Uh, I'd like to see some of that coming back as well. It'd be great to see some of that coming back. I also think it'd be good to see when um, cultural icons, as it were, but when celebs get involved in politics, it would be great if they knew a little bit more about politics. Mm if they were able to speak eloquently, because I'm not getting anything out of them joining in, um, particularly when there's great podcasts, as we were discussing earlier in, in, in the episode. Um, there's, there's so many great voices out there who can give you what you need. Um, and quite frankly, I just find their inability to say anything interesting about politics really depressing, and I just wish they'd stop. Um, yeah. A classic example of this, um, and I was amazed to see that it, it only got like 750,000 views on YouTube, because I'm imagining if Trump did something similar with like one of the few musicians that support him, like Kid Rock or Ted Nugent or whoever supports him, um, <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, Cardi B having this ridiculously awkward Zoom call with yeah. Biden. 20 minutes i couldn't believe more people hadn't seen it it was hilarious there was absolutely nothing of substance discussed no. at all in the 20 minutes it was no a trunk. i think that that's right it's like um when they do talk about politics it's very sound bitey it's very practiced there's no substance at all because i think it is part of that process where you just feel you have to say the right thing you haven't necessarily thought about it in much depth but you know there's this kind of pressure whether it's coming from yourself or from society to, to say the correct thing. But the thing that really irritates me is there is so much to rebel against at the moment. I mean, it's like a smorgasbord of stuff to rebel against. Uh, any kind of rebellious spirited uh, aspiring rock star or pop star has got uh, so much to choose from. There's the authoritarianism of lockdown. There's the authoritarianism of cancel culture. There's this nonsense idea that there are certain things you shouldn't express in public, um, the, the political correctness, uh, the attempts by the business elite to overthrow the largest democratic vote in British history. I mean, you, there's so much to choose from, but they haven't done it. And, and it's fallen to all the old blokes to do it, essentially. And another one to add to that list is Johnny Rotten. Um, oh, yeah. John Lydon, as he's now called, the original punk, who... Um, came out as pro Brexit and is now sounds like he's pretty pro Trump. And the point he made, he had a MAGA hat. And the point he makes is that um, he says Brexit was, was, was a punk rock event. And I think he's got a point about that. And he says it was a, it, it was a working class event. I think he's right about that too, in terms of huge numbers of working classes supported it as well as others, of course. Um, and I think he recognizes instinctively because it's in his, spirit um that the establishment is now on the side of um remain and biden and lockdown and which means that the people who are pro remain pro biden pro lockdown they might think they're being really free spirited and radical but actually they're just singing from the same hymn sheet as the old establishment and someone like johnny rotten and by the looks of things, Morrissey and, and Van Morrison, they kind of instinctively recognize this. Whereas I think a lot of younger musicians, sadly, um, go along with what is expected of them by the guardians of the cultural establishment. And the sooner they start kicking back against that, I think that could really have a transformative impact on culture, social media, on how young people understand the world. I actually think popular culture, popular music could play quite an important role in shaking all of that up. But sadly, at the moment, it's not really doing that. Yeah, maybe it will, but I can't see anybody doing it in that way. I mean, I, <laughs> when you think about the old, older great pop stars, you know, some of the people who've said um, no to the lockdown, like Eric Clapton, um, but you know, perhaps some of the more polarizing figures 
I mean, Johnny Rotten is, was, is, you know, one of the original punks, of course, and he's wearing the MAGA hat. But when you see kind of, it's all become so corporate when you see Billie Eilish and yeah. people like that on stage with Biden. Mm. I just can't think of anything more lame. And I'm not a yeah. Trump supporter. I'm not a Biden supporter. Mm. I'm not US citizen. Uh, but I just think it's just quite lame that we've got all these people being cheerleaders for a guy who is the embodiment of the Washington uh, swamp, as it were. He really is. Um, it doesn't take much to research that. And it was extraordinary to see big tech um, censoring that article in the New York Post. Whatever side you lean, even if you're the most pro-Biden uh, supporter, and you think that the New York Post article is rubbish, you've got to be, if you're an intelligent person, you've got to be pretty worried about Twitter just deciding, no, you can't share that newspaper link because I don't like it. Yeah, I think that's right. And um, I, I'm incredibly worried about the role of big tech and it's increasingly, interventionist role that it's playing in politics and in democracy and not only did it censor people sharing the, that new york post article on hunter biden but also it has deleted tweets and facebook posts by donald trump on the basis that they contained inaccurate information you know shock horror a politician says something inaccurate that's happened for the whole all of time um and they often censor people for holding supposedly risque opinions. Um, very recently, Twitter suspended someone's account because they said only women, only females get cervical cancer, um, which, you know, two years ago, that would have been a statement of biological fact. Now, of course, it is supposedly transphobic and e exclusionary towards trans men who can also get cervical cancer and you just think what kind of world are we going into when can we allow vast corporations to determine what people are allowed to say and even worse in which lots and lots of young people including supposedly rebellious young uh, cultural figures are cheering big tech on when it does that it's it's a very strange situation and i often find myself when will the breaking point come for this stuff and when will people start pushing back against it uh, i i can't see that happening to be honest and i think what people fail to understand is that big tech is meant to be the mouthpiece they're not meant to be the the arbiter it's not meant to be like oh i'm going to write an application into big tech to see whether they allow me to have my opinion <laughs> it's meant to it's like saying you know to trump sorry, that mouth, that, that belongs to me. Mm. Anything that comes out of it, you know, has got to be pre, you know, preordained. Um, it's just really worrying. Um, I, I'm conscious that we're short of time. And, and, and so uh, I have one final question for you, um, which, you know, it's ahead of tonight is the uh, US presidential debate, the final one, um, which, um, you know, against my better judgment, given how crap it was last time, I'm gonna stay up for and watch. Um, so I was wondering, you know, having interviewed a, a couple of people who are relatively knowledgeable about politics recently, um, or, you know, maybe people don't think they're that knowledgeable, but uh, an interesting one was Jeffrey Archer, who I interviewed and said it was going to be a blood bloodbath and Biden was going to destroy Trump. Um, you know, how do you think the next couple of weeks are going to play out? And do you think that um, a Trump defeat is going to be quite bad news for those people who are kind of against this, you know, whatever you want to call it, cancel culture or, or kind of woke culture, um, just kind of ramming political opinions down people's throats. Being apolitical or being skeptical or being, you know, more interested in a balanced argument seems to have gone out the window. Yeah, I think, um, I think that's absolutely right. I think I'm like you, I'm not pro-Biden, I'm not pro-Trump, uh, but I think a defeat for Trump will probably have negative consequences on politics around the world. Because what's clearly happening is that the kind of, I, I, I never know what words to use, but the kind of liberal elite, the kind of woke elites, the the technocratic elites, these people who have been who were pretty battered by the vote for Trump in 2016 and the vote for Brexit in 2016, um, they are looking for a way to regain their influence and regain their power. And they're trying to do that in various ways. 
in the UK, they tried to do it by preventing Brexit from happening at all. Um, in the US, they tried to do it with various impeachment measures and obsessing over the um, supposed Russian influence and, and trying to get Trump out in very underhand, undemocratic ways. These people are desperate to regain their power because they think they are the natural rulers. They think because they are very well educated, uh, because they are supposed experts, that they are the natural rulers of the rest of us. They are the people who have got to rule us, manage us, control what we say, and in some instances, control what we think. And they want to get back into power. And I think if Biden wins, which looks fairly likely from everything that we can see at the moment, I think that will be taken as a signal uh, for, for these kinds of people around the world that they can now really start to throw their weight around once again and, and get rid of this pesky populism that we've had over the past four or five years. I thought the victory of Jacinda Ardern in New Zealand um, was a good snapshot of what's to come because even though New Zealand, um, globally speaking, is a fairly small country, because Jinda, Jacinda Ardern is this uh, almost... Um, iconic figure for woke leftists around the world the fact that she got a landslide victory recently the other day is has been interpreted as this wonderful global event which will dislodge all the populist nonsense that we've had to put up with for the past four or five years so if her victory in new zealand has that emboldening impact just imagine what biden's victory in america would do so I'm, I'm worried that as a result of the COVID-19 crisis and as a result of Trump possibly losing the election in the US, we are going to see the populist moment and that broad desire that people have expressed for more freedom and more democracy. I think we're going to see that suffering a bit. And so those of us who believe in freedom of speech, freedom of choice, autonomy, liberty, democracy, all those important values, I think we really have our work cut out for us over the next few years. Well, uh, you know, I think a valuable source of comfort for people who believe in those things um, is, you know, spiked and, you know, the Brendan O'Neill show. So anybody who's enjoyed this podcast, um, I would really encourage you guys to go and check out the Brendan O'Neill show. It, I only discovered it during lockdown. It's been a huge source of comfort Good. just because it's a balanced thing 